Screencast Objective recording. C Cologne, take two, scene 12. Yeah, exactly. Action. Last year, I had um, Jason Harris modify my Objective CGN in Objective Gynecology or whatever, Objine or whatever. Objin, yeah, Objin, which I, I didn't know the word in English. I had never heard that term. We have other term. And apparently, it changed that on some slides, which nobody, so anyway, <laughs> luckily. Um, <laughs> what? Um, anyway, okay, uh, let me plug uh, for today the last sponsor, New Relic. I was also super happy to have them as a sponsor. For one thing, it's kind of a big name. If you are um, doing some kind of any measurement of your web server, uh, if you want to know um, how good you are doing or, or bad you are doing, um, you should definitely check, check out New Relic. Um, they have a bunch of amazing tools. So it's newrelic.com and thanks them for, uh, for allowing me to buy a gold iPhone. <laughs> um, all right, let's go to the next speaker, John Objective C Fox. <laughs> um, this is my first host in beautiful San Francisco. So the first time I was in San Francisco, in town. Uh, previously, I had been to a friend of mine working at Apple in in the Valley. But when I arrived in town, um, this was the first place I was sleeping at. So it's 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 pretty cool. Um, um, so first of all, uh, I, I always wanted to know what the C. Charlton. Charlton. Like Heston, Charlton Heston. Okay, Charlton Heston, okay. You see, I didn't ask what the F, but what the C. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. Um, the first time I really, not really met, but um, it, it's, all, it's always related to my podcast. This stupid podcast uh, who didn't bring me and much money. Uh, I did it for the love, but as a boomerang, I, I, I got a lot of things coming back. And uh, just um, th that goes back to what uh, a lot of people was, um, said today, like uh, Scotty spoke about the community love. This is for the reason why I do it. Damien just mentioned that you have to do things because you love. Uh, what you do, and so I interviewed uh, this nice guy here, right uh, at my side, in 2006, I think, or five, whatever. Very back back in the days, I'm telling you from a time. And then I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then I went to San Francisco for the Macworld 2007, and I was crazy enough to fly over there for my stupid podcast again, just for uh, going at the Macworld, and 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 I uh, was lucky enough to see the iPhone introduction by Steve himself. And uh, besides all my children, this is probably one of my uh, the nicest part of uh, uh, memories of my life, besides my children's, obviously. And my wife, uh, but it was pretty cool to be there in San Francisco when that happened. Uh, when I was sleeping at uh, at John's place, I was uh, I always recall sleeping with the Latinos because you you live in a you live in a very interesting neighborhood. What was it called again? The Mission. The Mission. It's for a Spanish-speaking guy like me. It's very interesting neighborhood. Uh, you <laughs> you, uh, you you hear more Spanish in this neighborhood than English. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that. Uh, Memory Miner is yet another of those awesome app. The, the only problem with it is that you need a lot of time to use this app. You need to be retired. That's the only way I can see. Or you need to be the, de the developer itself to put so many. I I'm guessing you are probably the, the, most, the biggest user of your app because you have an amazing collection. That's true, but I actually also wrote the app because I wanted it. Exactly, yeah. Very good reason to write an app in the first place. That's an amazing app, so check it out. And I, I have the feeling Findery, uh, kind of the new baby, is kind of an extension, a logical extension of uh, Memory Miner. Um, so without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, John Charlton Fox. No, he, he did say it. I don't know why. No, he does love you. No, no, please reassure the kids that he loves them much more than Steve Jobs. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Uh, okay. So, uh, my name is John Fox. My Twitter handle is Jembe. That's D-J-E-M-B-E, -E, like the West African drum, for those of you who listen to our podcast. Uh, I would like to talk to you about wasting nothing, tales of reuse. And uh, the best way to get started for that is to introduce someone very near and dear to my heart. I would like you to meet Gre I would like you to meet the clicker. There we go. Not that fast. 
meet grandma. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, who prepared my slides? So grandma is someone who uh, grew up in, in interesting times. You know, our, our parents and our grandparents grew up uh, during times of war, in the aftermath of the war. And uh, that actually is a picture of Rotterdam. That's what it looked like afterwards. And at that time, uh, if you were hungry and you wanted a snack, you just didn't pop down to the local Reve and say, you know, I would like some, uh, several bags of Haribo or, or uh, to, to find, you know, some fresh fruit or vegetables. You know, stuff was hard to come by. And um, as a result, you learned intuitively, don't waste anything because there wasn't that much to waste in, in, in the first place. And you know, I remember hearing from, from my mom in particular, she said during those, those times, is like, you know, everything was considered this huge treat. She had like these incredible memories of eating you know, apricots from a can or something. Or, and, and in particular, she also, you know, my grandmother, uh, she was very good at extending things. And so one of the dishes that would kind of speak of love in the family is the Sunday roast chicken. Mm, roast chicken. Who doesn't love roast chicken? And so if you were lucky enough to have a chicken to roast and you could find some stuff to put into it, you would roast the chicken, your friends would come along and it would be warm, it'd fill the house with all those great smells. You would be loved forever by your friends and family. But if you were smart, you would also find a way to extend it so that the very next day, you would take the bits of cold chicken that was left over and you maybe would go find a field where you might find some, some wild arugula or something. Uh, so everybody probably has some, some chickpeas floating around. And uh, if someone was sleeping with the milkman, there may be some extra yogurt available. Whatever was available, you would always extend the meal into the next two or three days. And then when you're done kind of picking everything you could find off of the, the chicken and reusing as much as possible, you would take the bones and some aromatics and you would put it in a pot with some water and you would slowly let it simmer for a number of hours because then you would get chicken stock. And so, you know, you're probably thinking to yourself, mm, that's tasty, but I didn't come here to the Food Network uh, Culinary Memories Conference. I came here to learn about software development. And so you think, what on earth does this have to do with software development? And the answer is very, very simply, everything. Because in life, no matter what it is that you're doing, you need to get the very, very most out of everything you do, every experience you have, and every relationship you cultivate. And so, speaking of relationships you cultivate over time, I would like you to meet a dear friend of mine. I would like you to meet Marcel. And Marcel is almost as old as grandma. So old is he that we can start talking about stories that happened 20 years ago, back in the era of Next. Now, I'm sure everybody here knows, except for those born in the last 10 minutes, uh, that Next was the company that was founded by Steve Jobs when he was unceremoniously booted from Apple. And uh, Next, as a company, made this great hardware, this beautiful black hardware. I mean, the original Next Cube was made out of magnesium. So great was it that you know, people spent an enormous amount of time figuring out how to set it on fire because it's highly flammable. Um, and, that, and that even at Next headquarters, the first time I went there, they had up on the wall literally high resolution photos of, of the, the circuit boards because everything was precisely laid out. They were just you know, incredibly gorgeous devices. And as beautiful as the hardware was, the software itself was, was even better. You know, so I, I came of age where one of the, the most interesting things that you could do with computers was desktop publishing, desktop prepress. Um, by the way, to the extent that I speak any, f uh, any good fake German is because I came to Dusseldorf several times and I learned such useful phrases as Unterfarbenreduktion, <laughs> under color removal. I think that's uh, how you say it. Um, and Vierfarbseparation or something like that. Anyway, so. Uh, and so, you know, one of the reasons why the Next Machine and Next Step operating system was so good for publishing is because it had advanced technologies like display postscript. So everything you saw on the screen was rendered exactly as it would be, do, uh, do, it would be rendered if you were doing it to the, the, the printed page. And uh, so good was it that, that it attracted the attention of a famous German company called Linotype Hell. And they were going to roll out this great software system called the Cygna Station, which if you were a commercial offset printer, it solved a huge problem. And there came this uh, event that I went to with the, the company I'd, I had co-founded at the time. We were making you know, publishing software, and we came to, to show our stuff at the Linotype Hell users group in, in Phoenix, Arizona, Scottsdale. 
and Steve Jobs himself was flying in on a private jet. Everybody was assured he would show up at the last minute. And everyone was nervous because he hadn't shown up, he hadn't shown up, but finally he shows up. His son Reed is there. He's bouncing Reed on his, on his knee while you know, the stalwart German executives were wondering what they'd gotten themselves into. And all the other arrayed third-party vendors were all kind of excited to be there. He finally shows up, they make the presentation. We're all like high-fiving each other over the weekend because we were sure that this was going to be the start of this magnificent market for, for professional desktop publishing and, and, and pre-press, all based around the next computer, which was dubbed the best computer in the world for publishing. And that was Sunday. The following Tuesday became known as Black Tuesday. And it's not Black Tuesday because of black hardware. It was Black Tuesday in the same way that you refer to stock market crashes or the collapse of a bubble, because that was the day, as Wikipedia tells us, that Next withdrew from the hardware business, fired, you know, laid off you know, almost half their company, and decided to close this incredible robotic factory in Fremont, California, where they manufactured these beautiful bits of black hardware, untouched by human hands, but in fact built by robots. So everybody was kind of hoping that uh, Canon, which was a, a big investor in Next, was going to kind of swoop in at the last moment and resume production of these fabulous machines and produce new ones in the future. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So as third-party software developers in that market, we were like, Yay, and then, oh, no. But fortunately, there was one rogue division of Canon uh, that decided that they were going to kind of pick up the mantle from Next Hardware, and as Next had announced that they were gonna make Next Step for Intel processors, uh, there was needed a machine on which it could run that was kind of somewhat as good as the old Next Hardware, and in came the Canon Object Station, which at the time was a you know, spiffy 100 megahertz Intel 486 processor, but was still, truth be told, this, this picture doesn't quite do it justice. It was actually a rather nice machine. And uh, I decided that I was going to kind of uh, go see if I could resurrect this machine, and I actually tweeted about it. And I'm saying, oh, look, I got an object station, thinking anybody would know what the hell I'm talking about. Of course, stuff says, wait, that's an actual thing? And my friend Marcel did come to my, my, uh, my say, uh, come to my rescue on Twitter saying, yes, it does actually exist, and it was quite a fine machine. So as I said, up into the attic, up to the man hutch, I went and found a, an Ethernet switch, and on the right side, plugged in the object station. On the left side, I had my MacBook, and in the middle there, in the dark where you can't see me, was me crouched down on the corner. Literally, the reason why is because I didn't really want to make the, 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 the time and effort to haul this machine down, put it on the dinner table, have my wife yell at me when she says, what's that black thing, and why is it making this sound while it's trying to boot up? Get that thing off the dinner table, back up to the man hutch. So I stayed in the man hutch, uh, and lo and behold, uh, after I blew some dust out of it, up came this old operating system, and it was just a tremendous flooding back of memories, because on the right-hand side is this app that I, I worked on called Collagi Palette, which was a kind of digital asset management system. It was really cool. It was, it, was, it was able to be pretty clever at the time, because with Display PostScript, you could take Adobe Illustrator files or encapsulated PostScript files or bitmap images and drop them into the window, and you get these really nice thumbnails of them. And, you could you know, drag and drop, everything was drag and drop. So if you look there, you can see I'm dragging and dropping the, the logo of this app into this other app called Extra Slide, which was this brilliant software written by who? Marcel. Marcel at the time was, I think, maybe you know, 17 or 18, no, he was, he was a student at the Technical University in Berlin at the time, and he'd, he'd worked on this amazing software. And it was, it was tremendously performant. And I was so amazed that I said, well, it was pretty cool back 20 years ago. Let's shove something big down its throat. So I went into my collection of, of snarky photographs and found the optimum photo to shove down its throat. And, hi, Scotty. <laughs> you regret letting me take your picture, don't you? <laughs> Anyway, so the, the point of it was is that this is a modern you know, DSLR picture. It, it, it's, it's quite a number of megapixels. And it, it, uh, I FTP'd it over to the, to the next uh, object station, dropped it into extra slide, and what do you know? It actually loaded up. Now, it is true, speaking of virtual memory, the hard drive, which was already loud, it was really going ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. 
Sorry. I need my help. We can we can fix this in post, right? All this, all this because you wanted me to touch you again? No. No, there, not there. 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 there right there. Yeah. No, it's better here. Okay, good. No, just. Yeah. <laughs> you missed the joke. Oh fuck. Exactly. Oh fuck. Fuck. <laughs> all right, that's cool. I've okay. Got you. All right, so, uh, and as I said, one of the things that this app could do is it could just take these, these images and it would, it would scale them. And, you know, one of the things I noticed when, when, it, when I was doing it is that, you know, you could sit there and move the slider and it would enlarge the image and you could pan it around, but it all did, did it in real time. And I was wondering, how did it do it? What was the magic behind it? And so, you know, that's one of the tricks it used is that, it would, it would basically scale it in, in chunky pixels, and then when it was done doing its work, it would kind of then render the high resolution. And I thought, wow, that was a pretty clever technique. And I asked Marcel, how did you do this? How did you achieve this effect? And he just, you know, he kind of yawned, looked at me, and he says, the secret is to be lazy. So the secret in all things, I would say, relating to, to computer science, and particularly in graphics uh, heavy processing, is to be lazy. Don't do more work than you need to. I said, that's very nice, Marcel, you know, but that's all kind of theoretically, practically speaking, how did you do it? And he looked at me like, why didn't you understand? And he says, draw low res bitmaps directly in your view when you're scaling or scrolling. And as if he said, well, now I've given you more detail, and I said, ah, course, I'm writing down, draw low-res bitmaps directly to your view while scaling or scrolling. And then he says, draw the high-res bitmaps when you're done doing that work. So I dutifully wrote that down. Now, of course, at the time, I couldn't write any code. Um, I only wished I could. And so it, it took me, in fact, a number of years to be able to do it. And so uh, just like the, the, the next step operating system you know, on Intel, when you say, I've got to shut it down, it actually takes a while until it's ready for you to pull the plug on it. And I think that it's, it's a pretty apt metaphor because all the technology that existed in Next Step not only came into uh, the Apple, you know, Mac OS that we've been using and knowing and loving, but of course in our phones as well. So uh, in the intervening time, I started working with some technology called web objects for doing web programming. It was kind of like the last gasp of, of Next software. Um, really, since everything is all about black things, it, the, the whole story of it kind of reminds me of that famous scene in Monty Python where the black knight is being embattled and kind of somebody you know, lops off his arm, like, there goes black hardware. That's okay, it's just a flesh wound. And then you know, they lop off this, ah, we're not gonna do next step for Intel anymore, we're gonna do open step for, for Windows. And then after that, that kind of didn't work, they chopped off another leg, ah, we're not gonna do that, we're just gonna do web objects. The, the, you were left standing on one leg, finally, um, we were saved with, with being able to write Cocoa apps for Mac OS X, and that's where we go forward in our story to about nine years ago, when I started working on this app, Memory Miner. And Memory Miner is this application that's it's all about digital storytelling. It's about taking photos and marking out interesting areas of them, indicating who's in the photo, where the photo was taken, what's going on, what's the backstory, how do we connect it to, to different things. Uh, that are going on in your life or in, in places that you care about. And so uh, one of the things that it does is if you look, I'm going to see if I can get this working. See the screen, whoop. I want video, oh, there we go. No, it, uh, there we go, okay, yes. So if you see that what it's doing there, that was the first place where I stole, uh, borrowed some techniques from Marcel for, well, it's true, okay. <laughs> that was, in fact, if you say to yourself, you thief, you don't even know the half of it. <laughs> Am I a thief? Oh yeah, I'm a thief. So let's look at another part of, of the app where I stole, I borrowed some techniques from Marcel. Uh, so this is the, 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 uh, the person icon editor. So that's a part of the application where you've taken all these photos and they, they take place describing parts of, of your life and they uh, may do things like allowing you to, to get an idea about, um, uh, the, about how you looked in a particular period of your life. So this is this thing uh, which if you look at it, now even that I look at it, I think to myself, wow, I really did steal. Um, so 
here you have this nice image scaling behind a frame. Uh, that's my father. My father was a total uh, geek. He was into amateur radio, and he figured, well, he wanted me to get into amateur radio as well. And so he would put an amateur radio catalog in front of me, and somehow through the process of osmosis, I would absorb it and then become a geek myself. And I have to say, um, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> But if you look at this, this functionality, and unfortunately I couldn't show you a screen movie of extra, extra slide, but I think Marcel can say, is that a total ripoff of, of the core functionality of extra slide? Eh, okay. <laughs> so, but, the, but to give you an idea, so this was an interesting thing, because as I said, I had no idea how to code. I, didn't, I wasn't able to steal Marcel's code. I wish I could have. I had to actually learn myself. But the important thing was learning the techniques. So. Now, another important thing that Memory Miner does is kind of the opposite. Instead of kind of trying to scale an Im image into a box, you can also use it to mark up areas on a photo um, for different purposes. This is a photo from NS Conference, and you see I can go in there and s type in some snarky text to describe really what's going on in that particular part of the photo, zoom into it, lickety-quick, I spit wickedly. Lickety-quick, I spit wickedly. And then in the next segment, whoops. Go through that again, sorry. I was too quick on the draw. And then the next segment, our own Mike Lee, where we can type the appropriate words, drop a beat, I'll catch it. So again, using these two photos, you can kind of start to tell a little story by marking up areas of the photo. Now, then you do all this work. And, and the other thing that I remembered about developing software for NextStep is like this very rarefied environment. You know, everybody who saw NextStep software said, wow, that's really great. When can we have it? And we said, well, yeah, just go buy a Next machine. And they're like, how much does it cost? Uh, I don't know, seven or $8,000. <laughs> and so they, you would hear the sound of crickets. And so the, the savior, the saving solution of, of our company at the time was to basically take everything that we'd done on NextStep and bring it to the web. And so. I kind of had that memory and that, that technique, and so that I was able to do things like publish, you know, publish stuff from Memory Miner, which was this rarefied app that, on the Macintosh, and publish it to the web, and be able to do things like um, panning and zooming in a web browser, so that you could reveal, in fact, that that, that person that you originally saw, that kid with a mohawk uh, in fuchsia pink, is in fact none other than our good friend Steve Scotty Scott. So, you know. Another interesting thing that I, I, I developed while working on Memory Miner is this idea that, again, when you have a limited number of resources, you have to be able to make the most of it. And in fact, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense. You probably have you know, maybe 12 or 15 pictures of your grandmother and maybe hundreds of your parents. And if you're a new, you know, when you become a new parent, you know, anybody who has a kid, you probably have 10,000 photos of your child by the time they're even you know, 12 months old because it's so easy. Well, back then, it wasn't so easy to take photographs. So one of the things that you would do is think about the photograph not as the photograph, but as the starting point of a conversation. Because in that photo, that's my brother, the one with the choke hold. And the one being choked, of course, is me. And so really, what you want to do is kind of delve into the backstory and ask yourself, or now I would ask myself, why is my brother choking me? So I would give my side of the story by recording video and attaching it to it. and then. If I ask my brother to do the same thing, he says, well, I'll tell you why I choked you, because you were an annoying little shit. That's why. And you deserved it. It's a good thing that your mom likes you. Otherwise, you'd be dead by now. It's like, wow, uh, Richard, that was kind of more sharing than I was hoping for. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, using this technique of, of recording video and audio and using it to highlight something led me to another project that I worked on, uh, an app called Phrase Farm. And Phrase Farm basically is kind of like a, a, a video booth that you take language phrases, different phrases in different languages, and you have them recorded by native speakers, and you kind of explain the backstory of it. So this is a, a great phrase so that if you're in Italy and you happen to run somebody's poor cat over and kill the cat, the appropriate phrase to say is, penso che mi serve un padre, which means, I think I need a priest. So that's what the talent sees. The person who's the operator sees something like that, and it's important when you're talking in Italian, you must gesture, because without the gesture, you just can't really communicate. Um, and that was another derivative work from my work in Memory Miner, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. It, it. It's what powers this site called Mightyverse, which has you know, thousands of phrases, really interesting phrases in lots of different languages, um, including series like this of appropriate phrases in Arabic for when you're in Beirut. 
Um, so in addition to be able to do pedestrian things like can I have a glass of Arak, which is this kind of uh, licorice liqueur, um, you can also you know, learn how to say useful phrases for Beirut like I do not wish to ride in the trunk or that is not the way to the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm hoping nobody is like, <laughs> okay. So uh, in addition to doing these kind of fun things, it, uh, this, this application Phrase Farm and this service Mightyverse was actually put to, to really good use preserving languages. And I think that's really cool. So this is a, an article in the New York Times and there is my, my, my humble little software being used to preserve obscure uh, Native American languages and Hawaiian. And um, it's really cool. But you know, there is one language, unfortunately, that, that I haven't been able to preserve, uh, but I've been able to, to help explain, and that is the language known as Jive. Hmm. Can I get you something? Some more food. Put a land into the bone, take me up. Take me. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Cuddy say can't hang. Oh, stewardess, I speak Jive. Oh, good. He said that he's in great pain and he wants to know if you can help him. All right, would you tell him to just relax and I'll be back as soon as I can with some medicine. Just hang loose blood. She's gonna catch up on the rebound on the man's side. What it is, big mama? My mama didn't raise no dummies. I duck a rap. Cut me some slack, Jack. It's a cutting thing. Chomp the one to help. Chomp, don't get the help. Say can't hang, say seven up. Jack, ass dude don't got no brains in it. Now, when I, was a, when I was a teenager, predictably, that was about my most favorite film in the world. And so I actually was really pleased to be able to, to work on another project and another application, uh, this one called Showrunner. And Showrunner is this app I wrote for a company called Watch With, and Watch With uh, collects and builds data that feeds second screen applications, which are companion application used to, to help understand or follow along with movies and television programs. And uh, this is what it looks like in, in the middle of it. You have the video area, which you can scrub through in real time. Uh, up there on the top, you have the various scenes, which capture, kind of help express what's going on in the scene. If you had one image to be able to describe, uh, you know, scene, uh, whatever number this is, this is the, the good image to use. And even within that, you know, you have the ability to do things like select just that portion of the frame of the video that captures the essence of a particular actor in context in the film, in character. Now, in case that, that looks similar or to some things that you may be seeing, in this case, I don't have to be angry at, at or nobody can be angry about me stealing from them. I actually stole from myself. And so what's nice about the application is that, again, it does all this publishing work on Macintosh, so a relatively number, you know, a rather small number of people use it, but it feeds data to second screen applications like this. Here it is for iPhone, which it's following along as the scenes pass through. You can tap on any of these different areas and learn about what's going on. So that, in fact, you can then discover that the, you know, the, the woman in that scene is not just some arbitrary white woman from central casting, but part of the goat, part of the gag there is, in fact, that she became famous as, as somebody's mother. She was June Cleaver. The, 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 the prototypical you know, white bread mom in post-war 50s America, and the, the, the actress's name is Barbara Billingsley, so you know, she's probably the last person in the world who would be expected to understand how to speak jive. Now, the other kind of uh, backstory that's interesting about that is that you remember these kind of big, scary-looking guys the, the reality is, is that they're, they were both kind of classically trained theater actors, and they got so heavily typecast as being the jive guys is that they could almost never got much additional work um, doing anything but that. So this is them not that many years ago at the Comic-Con convention writing out the last bits of their fame. So um, again, if you look at, at what this app does, it's really all completely related to stuff I've been working on, and I've really had a pretty long ride dating back to some of these first techniques um, and experiences. But you look at that and you say, well, what have you done for us lately? And so now I'm gonna tell you about some stuff I've been working on lately. So uh, back in December, I joined a company called Findery, and Findery is an application uh, and it's, it's, it's a platform, and it was created it, uh, about two years ago, and, and the founder of the company is this woman named Katerina Fake, who was the co-founder of Flickr. So how many here know Flickr? Okay, 
So to speak to a point about community, you know, the thing about Flickr that made it really interesting wasn't really anything to do about how it hosted photos because there were lots of different places you could shove photos on the internet. What made Flickr really interesting was the community that was so heavily you know, cultivated and the fact that you could put a picture up there and say, I don't know that much about it. Does somebody in the community know something about it? Or is there anybody else in the world that shares my passion for X, Y, or Z? People went to Flickr for doing that. Um, and so Findery is, it takes some of those very concepts of it instead of, but instead of the atomic uni unit being the photograph, the atomic unit of Findery is the note. And the note is basically something that you kind of tack to a geographic location. You can say, here's a little bit of text or here's a picture or video that really helps you understand what makes this particular place a place. Um, and it's user-generated content. It's been available on the web uh, for starting about uh, almost a year ago. So it's been seeded with a carefully, slowly grown community. And uh, when I joined, my job was to basically take that experience, what was available on the web, and build up something that could work on a phone. And so this is an example of it's the same content, but in a different form factor. And of course, one of the things you'd expect with this is that you're looking at this strange thing, you're thinking, what, what is that? Um, and the only well, way to really kind of find out what it is is to kind of zoom in a little bit. So I, that was one of the tasks I worked on early on. I said, well, uh, there's a right way to do things and a wrong way. And my, my technique that I can share with you is always do the wrong way first so that you can then finish it up doing the right way. So let me explain. <laughs> um, so if I go through here, you tap on it and all of a sudden, well, you got to the image and, and yes, you could you know, kind of zoom around in it, but that's not quite what you were looking for. And so you don't ever wanna do this. You don't ever wanna leave your, your poor user staring at a black screen with the spinning cursor of death because that's just, that is not treating your users with love and you should always treat your users with love. How should you treat your users? Love. With love, thank you. So let's try this again and see how it should work. Oops, I get confused, sorry. So, uh, ah, that's better. So you may have noticed in there is that what happened right away is that you could see the image at all time. Uh, and so let's do it one more time. You see that? As soon as they tapped on it, they were still looking at the image. And this reveals a very, very important thing. Kids take notes. There will be a test because user perception of speed is as important as actual speed. Say it with me. User perception of speed is as important as actual speed. Right, Marcel? Yep. Okay. That's something, a great lesson that Marcel taught me and it was really good. And whereas in years past, as I said to him, I could experience this concept but could never show the codes, right now, if you ask me, do you have the codes? I has to codes, and so let me share some little quick tip about this. So this is the method that gets called uh, when you tap on that image, show full screen note image. And what it does basically is, is you gotta get the full high res image. And again, this is, it started out as a website, all the content is hosted on the web, but in fact, the, you, know, you need to bring it to the phone. So the first thing you need to do is get the URL for that full res image. And you know, we may be hosting it or maybe some external media, so the photo might be hosted on Flickr or Instagram, whatever. But whatever, you need the full res URL, and the first thing you do is you ask the image controller, you set the image URL on it, and you let it go do its thing. Now, that was the first implementation, and so yes, it worked, but it had the side effect of just having a little blank image to stare at. The secret sauce is to be able to say, well, get a placeholder image URL. And in this particular case, uh, you get that placeholder image URL, but since you've already downloaded it, why go ask to do it again? Why, why reinvent something? You already got it, reuse it. Now in this particular case, you know, the, the initial response, it's in the cache somewhere, so you need to ask the, the uh, URL cache for it, saying, hey, do you have this response, and can I have it, please? And you have to be prepared for failure. You might say, you know, you, just because you asked me for that cached image doesn't mean I'm gonna give it to you. It might, it's not always gonna say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some days it might just say, nine, I don't have it. Uh, so then you have to have a fallback plan, so you might go to a smaller, lower res image that you might have gotten earlier, or if you really you know, wanna be very thorough, you might just get an even smaller one and just stuff it in there. But you set the placeholder image, and up comes your, 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 your view, and your web view in this particular case, and render it, and then everything will be happy. Now, wait. 
you're using a web view in a, a native application, why would you do that? It's like, use a web view? Well, because yes, we can. Yes, we can use HTML to render portions of our native application. Why? Well, because HTML and CSS is really great for laying out text and images. You know, Marcel would probably just do it in PostScript. Uh, the more modern kind of layout languages is HTML and CSS. And it's really good for, for laying out stuff like that. It's not good for, for building kind of the interactivity of it, but for laying out and describing how it should look, it's great. But, but, the, the important thing is the interaction between a web view and your controller can be a little bit tricky. And it's always just those kind of, those little things, those little differences. Example, well, in order to kind of illustrate this point, I have to start with another point, and that is you really always need to give your application early and often, like has been said, to anonymous first-time user. So here's my prototypical anonymous first-time user, meet Alex. And uh, he's somebody who actually showed my application to literally kind of a week ago, and I showed him just that little thing that you were looking at. And when you show your app early and offer to brand new users, there's one thing that you must do. Just hand the damn phone over, shut up, and watch. What should you do? Hand the damn phone over, shut up, and watch. And so what I noticed from that is that just because you're used to tapping on something and, and seeing it, people more also double tap on an image to try to view it. It's a normal thing. And so when I was watching him tap on it, double tap on it, I just wanted to like crawl out of my skin and say, dude, it's, it's a hyperlink, you only need to type once. Nobody cares how you know, the techniques used to be able to let, you know, lay out your page. That's an implementation detail. The fact that you cheated and uses HTML or whatever, they don't care. So now I was like left perplexed. It's like, well, that's a little bit tricky. How do I do that? Um, and so I asked myself, can I have decodes for doing that? And, and since you might want to know, I'm gonna uh, let you know on some, some tricks I use for doing this. So in the view controller, which you know, manages that, 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 that view, I use part of it is a web view for doing the layout of the image, and then there are other parts that you didn't see. Those are all native views. Um, and so what I needed to do is basically have a, a, a gesture recognizer. And so I set up a gesture recognizer, and I set it up saying I only care about you know, gestures that involve two taps. And the little separate thing, the little clever thing that you're doing is that instead of trying to add the gesture recognizer to a web view, you need to basically add that gesture recognizer to the top level view, and you then use the fact that you can become the delegate for a gesture recognizer, in this case, to do two things. One is that you know, UI web view is this kind of black box. It has all these kind of specialized gesture recognizers built into it, and it's hard to kind of interrupt that but you can have a gesture recognizer on a top level view, and then you can do something very simple where you can say, okay, give me the, rec the, the, the point where some user tapped, not, not in, in my hosting view, but in the coordinate system of the web view itself, and then you can use the fact that you can actually send a little bit of JavaScript to the web view and ask the web view in JavaScript, hi there, here's a coordinate, can you please tell me the DOM element that was tapped? And it's very nice, and, and if it's feeling friendly, it will give you the answer. And so the web view uh, will return the, the return statement, and, and so you can ask, well, did it tap on this DOM element called note-image? And if yes, you can then say, well, good, show me the full screen image. So just to kind of round trip this whole thing, this is a, you know, a little snippet from the markup used to render a note as HTML, and the important part here is, is I'm, I'm wrapping that image inside another DOM element, and I'm telling that DOM element exactly how big it should be so that the page doesn't jump around. Because again, it's gonna take time to download that image, and while the user is waiting, you don't want the, the page to jump around like I jump around in front of you. You want to stay nice and stable while the, the image data comes across the network and everything is very happy. First time impressions. So, you know, one of the reasons why I like traveling is that uh, it, it allows me to look at the world through a fresh eye. And uh, while you're looking at the world through a fresh eye, you may remember that uh, things that you, you thought you remembered or thought you knew don't, you know, you, you may have forgotten them. And that's really something that can happen with your app. So, you know, if you're lucky, a user will download your app. Already that's, that's a great thing. 
But the reality is, is they may download your app because somebody says, hey, you got to download this app, it's awesome, and then they'll forget about it for a couple of weeks. And then they're left looking at the app, wondering where they should touch, what they should swipe, where they should pick. They have no idea. It's just like going into the bathroom, and this really happened. I go into the bathroom, I want to wash my hands, and I'm staring at the sink. It's like, how does this thing work? Because there's no handles. And it's like, ah, that's OK. I've been on a train before. I'll just look for the little pedal beneath, and I'm looking underneath. Some, some kind soul in this room watched me looking like an idiot, tapping on a thing. Where's the water? Where's the water? And he just kind of gently walked over. It's like, you just twist. Now, it's very obvious for him because he lives here. But it wasn't obvious for me. And what I really wanted, but what I got, is I got some coaching. And you should do the same thing with your apps. You, at some point, the user is going to be first time using their app, your app, and you need to coach them. So what does that mean? We're going to talk about coach marks. So again, a quick you know, screen movie. We're going to see this is what the app looks like when it just starts. It, it's had a first run experience, but at some point, it, asks, it, it needs to get going. And uh, what you'll see here is, as this view comes down, and these little coach marks animate onto the screen. And it kind of gives a quick reminder about what, it, what, what the app is supposed to do. And what does the app do? Oh, can't show you. It's redacted right now because the app is not released. But we want to focus on the coach marks, right? And so you notice how it happened. There's this nice view that slides in from the top, and little pointers, little bits of artwork that says, tap here to do that, tap here to do that, swipe here if you want to do that. And last but not least, a little kind of OK, let me get started. So uh, I'm not going to show you what the app does, but I'll at least show you how I did the coach marks. And in this case, it's actually even simpler. <clears throat> and simple is good. Is simple good? Simple's real good. And the, the nib file is, very, is, is just basically it's the, the simplest view you can imagine, which just happens to have a couple of images in there in UI image view. And the only trick I'm, I'm, I'm you know, kind of trading on is the fact that there is a, a, a stacking order to views. And so that way, you can control the order in which, there we go. You can control the order. <laughs> How about this one? Thank you. Uh, it's, it's so hard being famous. Uh, so <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> So you can control the order in which it comes in. And so the one that's you know, down furthest on the list is the last one that's going to show up. And so then when your view loads and it's presented on the screen, you can just have a very simple method like this, fade in all marks. And what it does is it, first of all, it, you got to find out which of these views are actually UI image views, because those are the ones you care about. So that's brain dead easy. You just say what class is it, and you add it to an array. And the, 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 really the meat of it is to do this, is that now you know which image views are in your view. And you're just going to do a little very simple animation block here. So you'll just basically do an alpha transition um, in a, some period of time. And then as you are looping through each of the image view, you're basically delaying the start of the next animation. And then when the last image is, is there, you start another animation block, which is going to fade on another view which you care about, which is the UI button, which is the please get started um, view. So you know, one of the things that you see is that I try to put comments in, in, in code. And that reminds me it's time for a, not, not a commercial break, but a public service announcement. And now, When, you're, when your colleagues are looking at, at your code, remember, here's something that can happen. You know, you notice me, I'm kind of silly. I like to go out. Sometimes I like to have a beer or two. And it's possible that tonight or any other night, I might drink a little beer too many, step outside, and get run over by a bus. And I'm confident that it doesn't matter if I get run over in the bus, because this will never happen. Where are the comments? That will never happen. And it took me a while to get to that point, because if somebody looks at code and say, I don't understand what's going on, there's no comments, you didn't explain it, you know, your first inclination is probably something like this. So <laughs> you don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't be the person that that's, you know, wants to think that, hey, it doesn't matter because I'll always be around. You might not always be around. So for the love of, of all that is sacred, comment your code. OK, thank you. Enough of our public service announcement. Uh, one of the things that struck me about coming here to Cologne is that you exit the train station and you immediately see this enormous church. And I, I thought, well, wow, why did they put it there? You know, I just got here, and why do I have to you know, make a confession? 
Well, I will make a confession. That's not my grandmother. I lied. This is my grandmother. That's my grandma, and that's for reals. That's, she's probably about 15, 16 years old at that time. She's actually on a donkey. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have cropped that out, but she is in, in, in Gloucestershire, which is not that far from where Scotty and his forebears live. So it, it is possible that, that somebody, the milkman that somebody might have been sleeping with may have been somebody in, in Scotty's line. We don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. But th that is my grandmother. Um, this is also my grandmother. And uh, so that, that is, is my mom. And my mom is there, you know, in a ditch. Because it, it so happened that my grandfather, and this is true as well, uh, was a, a, an engineer, except for he worked on hardware. That's, that's him building kind of irrigation systems in Egypt. And since he was always away, you know, literally in a ditch, my grandmother, smart and wonderful as she was, thought, well, if I want my daughter to know her father, I need to bring her to the work site. And the reason I'm thinking about this is a little bit, it's like it, when it's all said and done, there's not a whole lot of difference between doing software development and digging in ditches because you're always down there in the muck hoping things will work and, and trying to fend off distractions and your family never sees you, so sometimes they have to bring you to the ditch. Um, but the other reason I want to show you that image and to kind of to, to bring some parting thoughts is that I think it, it's important to be grateful because, you know, in reality, we're the luckiest people in the world, we really are. I mean, we get to work in this incredible technology, have this great community of, of smart people to, to, to work with. You know, in my, in my case, I'm absolutely grateful to a bunch of people. I mean, I'm incredibly grateful to Marcel. I mean, I've known him for so many years and so many of the techniques and, and skills to the extent that I have them, I learned them from him. Um, I also am grateful to this guy named Anard Brouwer. He's the first Dutchman I ever worked with. And he taught me this incredibly powerful trick. So when we were in the office together, you know, he was off in his own office, and sometimes I'd hear this, this phrase, and it was like, Godverdamme. And I was like, so is there anybody here who's Dutch? Okay, so as this man will truthfully tell you, Godverdamme translate in English as, gosh darn it. <laughs> right? So. If you have a problem with your code and you know, it doesn't compile or your app falls over and dies, the important phrase to utter is um, Now, the other people I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for are people like Bill Bumgarner. I mean, there was a time, you may not believe it, but I was just dumb. I was so stupid. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I would try and try to make these things work. This is in those, those years where I was trying to kind of replicate what, what Marcel and other masters were doing. And I would ask the dumbest questions. How do I know how stupid they are? It's because I actually looked at my mailbox from 20 years ago on that object station. I almost burst into tears and burst out laughing. And when I noticed, it was, was the really the patience among the people who taught me. And even, even to this day, you know, there are people like Reiner. Reiner has answered so many questions for me on chat to say nothing of the fact that he, he's delivered all this uh, source code like, you know, RB split view, without which I, I couldn't have made memory miner. These people have been incredibly patient and kind, and I'm just unbelievably grateful to them. And it reminds me of uh, an African-American phrase which has been used since the, the darkest days of slavery, and it's called each one teach one. And what that means is that there was a time, there's even a time now where it's like, you know, they're in a family, it might be the first person who goes to college, it may be the first person in an extended area. So if you had some knowledge and skills that were hard won, you better be offer, able to offer it back. And so my little lesson on this, my closing thoughts is that if somebody says and does something nice for you, be sweet, be kind, thank them for doing it. But if you really want to thank somebody who's given you a lot of help, the honorable thing to do, the thing you must do is you must spread that knowledge and teach and help somebody else. And so with that thought, I would like to get to our, our final section, which is what I promised, the fabulous prize section. So I brought with me from sunny, perfect San Francisco, from a small producer around the corner from me, some really tasty salted caramels. And the caramels are made with palm sugar, and so it has a very particular taste, and the contrast between the sweet and the savory is really quite good, and I would like to give them out but now, first, Marcel gets one just for being Marcel. So after years and years of doing all this work, <laughs> you now, if only there could be a thought bubble. It's like, dude, I launched your career, and all I get is a freaking box of caramel. <laughs> but OK, now for the rest of you here, you can have one of these, but you have to answer some question. So first question, if you've got a lot of work to do, 
How should you approach the situation? You got graphic intensive work, what should you do? What should you be? Lazy. Lazy, who was the, okay, you were the first answer person. <laughs> be lazy, very good, you're welcome. Next question. What is this as important as actual speed? There. Very good. And the very last question. What is the magic word to say when your code is not working? <laughs> All right, I don't know who to, I mean, since everybody said it, I, I knew everybody would get that. Okay, so. Thank you. I would say with these last moments, please stay in touch. You know, follow me on Twitter if you're not. And uh, I'm very serious about what I said. You know, there's a, a coding day tomorrow, so you, you've got an idea about the types of things I've been working on. If there's anything that you've been working on, you have questions, it would, it would be my honor to help you with it. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. We don't really have time for questions, but the panel is coming. So if you have questions, keep them for the panel. Uh, the other thing is the coding day is not tomorrow, but the oh, day sorry, after. Oh, sorry, Thursday, tomorrow. yeah. Um, that right. too. Get all of here, because in like uh, 15 minutes, we will have to come back for the, for the panel. All right, and another round of applause. Thank you, John. I forgot to thank one last person, Daniel. Thank you so much for lending me your car. I know that you thought you were just lending me your USB key, but you know it was attached to the keys for your car, so.